Welcome everybody uh, to today's program, Artistic Insights with L.F. Tantillo. Uh, this is the fourth uh, talk that we've hosted. Uh, it's a series of talks that we've hosted uh, in conjunction with Len's exhibition, A Sense of Time, The Historical Art of L.F. Tantillo, which is on display at the Albany Institute until July of this year. My name is Patrick Stenshorn. I am the Director of Interpretive Programs at the Albany Institute. Today, I am joined by my colleague, Victoria Waldron, uh, the museum's educator. Uh, she is on the official Albany Institute of History and Art Education account. So if you do happen to stumble across any technical issues during today's program, please feel free to reach out uh, to Victoria. Uh, she just typed a message in the chat box. She has all of the meeting control, so she will be the best person to be able to help troubleshoot any issues that you might be having. For today's presentation, uh, we ask that you please double check and make sure your microphone is on mute. If you are using a device that has a webcam on it, please feel free to have that turned on or off, whichever you are most comfortable with. We will conduct a question and answer session at the conclusion of the presentation today. Uh, I think today, if you do have a question or a comment, please feel free to type it either into the chat box or if you feel more comfortable unmuting yourself and asking uh, your question, I think we can do that today as well. Um, so for our speaker today, I know many of you know him, but I will give him his official introduction. Uh, Len Tantillo is a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, he is a licensed architect uh, who left the field of architect architecture to pursue a career in the fine art of historical and marine painting. Since that time, his work has appeared internationally in exhibitions, publications, and film documentaries. He is a fellow of the American Society of Marine Artists. His work is included in the collections of many institutions like the Fenimore Art Museum, the Minnesota Museum of Marine Art, the Albany Institute of History and Art and numerous historical societies and corporate and private collections in the United States and abroad. He has produced hundreds of paintings and drawings of New York state history. And in 2016, he was elected a fellow of the New York Academy of History. So please join me in welcoming Len Tantillo. So are we all ready to start, Patrick? We are all good, all good to go. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I want to welcome everybody to um, this uh, video, uh, which is part of a series that um, are, are being presented by the Albany Institute of History and Art. I don't know, I'm having a little Oh, there we go. Uh, part four uh, is going to focus on steam power in the industrial age. And um, if you've been following along, um, they have been sort of chronologically organized. Um, so we left we left the uh, last video um, with the end of the age of sail. Um, the construction of the Erie Canal and um, steam, steam, uh, steam boating. Um, this is the earliest example that I could find of any kind of a steam engine. It was built in the first century uh, by Heron of Alexandria. It's called an eolophile. Um, basically, it was a a small container filled with water uh, that was heated until it was boiling. Um, steam was carried by pipes up into a copper uh, sphere with two uh, outlets. And as the pressure rose inside the ball, um, it would spin. It took 15 centuries for inventors to start to figure out what to do with that um, phenomenon. Um, and it was inventors um, like uh, James Watts and others uh, that um, were able to make a machine out of it. 
uh, Jonathan Hull, another English inventor, proposed a paddle uh, steam powered tugboat. Uh, it never uh, was, was built, um, but it was proposed in the uh, early 1700s. And that invention was followed by others. Uh, by the late 1700s, uh, a French inventor had actually uh, constructed a steam powered paddle wheel uh, steamboat. These are both models, but you can see the, uh, the design of the uh, uh, machine and how it operated these, drove these paddle, paddle wheels. Um, in America, John Finch designed uh, a successful steamboat that operated on the Delaware River in 1787. Really unusual contraption in that uh, the steam engine actually operated oars. So it wasn't very practical, but it did, it did work. He built a full-size version of it and he, did, he was able to operate it. About 20 years passed, um, Robert Fulton, uh, with financing from Robert Livingston, a prominent from a, the prominent Livingstons of uh, uh, New York State, uh, was able to build a steam-powered passenger uh, steamboat, the first one. This is a photograph of a replica of Fulton's steamboat that was built for the Hudson uh, Fulton celebration in 1909. Um, so in August of 1807, uh, Fulton, with passengers on board, made the journey from New York to Albany. It was a two-day trip. Um, they spent the first night of their travels uh, at the home of his sponsor, Robert Livingston, who had a mansion high above the banks of the Hudson River, uh, south of Albany called Arrow House. Um, the building is gone. Um, this, it's part of a National Historic Site. There is a mansion there uh, that was built later um, for his family, but the original ruins are there. And there are drawings uh, and a few photographs of the original uh, Livingston House. That would have been the house that um, Fulton and his, his uh, guests would have stayed at. So um, I built a digital model of the house uh, based on what I could see from the photographs. And with that, I put together uh, this painting of uh, the beginning of the second day uh, on, in the voyage of the North River Steamboat, as it was referred to then, Robert Fulton's famous steamboat, which later came to be known for the estate of Livingston. Um, it was referred to from to this day as the Claremont. And here we are on a on a misty August morning as it makes way makes way uh, makes its way to Albany. This is a painting I made quite a long time ago, almost 40 years ago, of um, the city of Albany in the 1860s. And by that time, steam traffic on the Hudson River had become considerable. There were vessels of all sizes, all types, uh, from harbor tugs to very large uh, passenger uh, steamers. There were towboats, there were ferries. Um, and th this, is, uh, this is, is an indication of the, uh, the success that uh, steam travel had brought to um, cities all over um, America, but in particular the, the cities on the Hudson River. Um, not only was there tra massive traffic going on uh, north and south, but the Erie Canal had been completed and uh, America was now linked to the uh, Great Lakes and that traffic was coming through Albany. This is a painting that I made um, of the uh, area around Quay Street on inside the Albany Basin. And you can see that you know, a tug is moving a barge around. This would have been going on constantly in, um, in the Albany Basin. 
Um, the tugs were operated by various companies that we're going to be talking about one shortly, a very interesting one. Uh, this is Lock 33 of the Erie Canal, St. Johnsville. Um, this is a this is very typical of the Erie Canal. There are two locks side by side. There was so much east-west traffic in the Erie Canal that they felt that two locks would be able to move the traffic more efficiently uh, than one. Uh, this is a later date. So this is the, the late 1800s um, when they were allowing uh, steam steamboat uh, tugs uh, steam steam tugs on the Erie Canal. Up until that time, the barges were moved by um, mules and horses. The uh, canal tugs had to operate at very slow speeds because any wake they generated would erode the wooden bank, the uh, earthen banks of the canal. This is another um, uh, canal painting. The Erie Canal in this painting is up here where the, um, the, the uh, tugboat is, um, right there. Um, this is the Mohawk River down here. Um, this is, um, some of you may have heard the name Vischer's Ferry, the town of Vischer's Ferry. Um, this is actually Vischer's Ferry, this vessel. It was a very simple um, double-ended ferry. It wasn't operated by oars or sails. Um, it was operated by the current in the river, and it was very clever. It was an invention that had, had been around since Roman times. There was a cable strung across the river, and um, there was a rig at both the, um, the bow and the stern of the ferry, and by shortening these uh, cables, shortening one side, lengthening another, and creating an angle, just the current of the river would propel the vessel from one side to the other, and then they'd reverse the process and it would come back. Uh, to this day, the canal is long gone. You can still see where it was if you visited this site. The embankment, uh, this stone pier that was built for a later bridge is still there. And some of this cable can be seen in the trees where it's sort of grown into the trees uh, that lined the, the riverbank. Uh, when I was mentioned the um, uh, steam tugboats and steam towboats, uh, one of the families that really stands out is uh, the family of Samuel Schuyler. And this is somewhat of a controversial subject, although um, I have my own ideas about why it's controversial. Um, in 1805, um, Samuel Schuyler married a woman named Mary Martin. Um, they had uh, 10 children. In 1809, Samuel is, uh, is listed for the first time in the Albany tax rolls as a black man who owned property. In 1813, um, he's mentioned again, this time in the city directory, and he's listed as skipper. Samuel Schuyler, a free person of color. And in that same year, they give his address on Quay Street as 204. In 1815, um, he, he buys more property and eventually owns quite a chunk of, of um, uh, commercial real estate on the Hudson River. Um, and he continues in 1822 to appear in the city directory as a free person of color. By the 1830s, um, he's joined by his two teenage sons, Samuel and Thomas, and they serve as uh, crewmen aboard his uh, sloop. Now, the sloop painting that I'm showing here is one that I made of a different vessel, the, the, the Lancy, which was a sloop that was owned by the Van Bergen family. But the sloop that uh, Samuel Schuyler would have owned would have been very similar to that. It would have been in that same uh, time period. Business was really good. He was moving uh, cargo from Troy to Albany and beyond. And his sons, who were entrepreneurial uh, and uh, visionary, could see that um, the era, with the, the era of sale coming to an end and uh, 
the vast majority of commercially successful traffic on the Hudson River was going to steam-powered vessels, uh, they started to uh, buy steamboats that they could use for towing. Um, and by the time of their father's death, uh, the brothers Thomas and Samuel Schuyler had a successful towboat company uh, on the river. They owned numerous towboats, tow tow boat, steam towboats, um, and could tow massive amounts of cargo in strings of barges from one end of the Hudson River to the other. And we know some of the names of the boats uh, that they owned. Um, Anna was one, Smith Briggs was another one. Um, their business was so successful that by the 1880s they were issuing stock and they were one of the largest towing companies on the Hudson River, owned by a black, owned by anyone, but they happened to be uh, uh, of African descent. Uh, this is the um, the house, uh, the Schuyler House. Uh, it still exists. It's in South Albany. Uh, the turret on the roof was built so that the captains could see their fleet in the Hudson River. The most beautiful vessel of all the vessels in their fleet uh, was a um, um, uh, steam-powered paddle wheel uh, towboat, towboat called America. Both the Schuyler brothers um, are buried in the Albany Rural Cemetery. This is the marker uh, of their grave. And the marker is interesting because there are uh, marine icons on the faces of the monument, uh, ropes and anchors and things like that. This is, the, this is their, their uh, towboat America. And it was, it was beautiful. I mean, the design of it is beautiful. Paddle box was beautifully painted and it carried that name, America. So I titled this painting Portrait of America. And the character that I've placed up here on the upper deck is Thomas himself, sort of looking down river. This is a painting I made of the Dayliner Albany, um, built later in the 1800s. Initially, it was uh, designed with. Um, uh, paddle boxes very obviously present. In its later incarnations, they were built. They were built inboard so that you couldn't see them um, at all. Uh, Albany was the sister ship to the New York, and um, the Albany and the New York operated it. They'd begin each day at opposite ends of the Hudson River and pass at approximately Poughkeepsie uh, to the opposite port but Albany was a beautiful vessel. Uh, this is a view of Troy um, around 1850s. Um, actually, when you drive along 787 um, and uh, you're on the uh, Albany side of the river looking across toward the Troy side, this uh, row of buildings looks pretty much the same today as it did back at that time. Uh, you can see the canal barges are starting to be grouped together uh, to be towed down river uh, by the towboat um, Trojan. Um, and um, I did notice when we were signing on that Don and Ann Eberly um, are tuned in to this, this video today. Uh, Ann Eberly's ancestor, um, her grandfather, great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather, I can't remember which, was the owner of uh, the Trojan and other towboats. Uh, the passenger vessel that's coming down river is the Elida, and behind the Elida is the Green Island Bridge. This, this was actually called Center Island at the time, but that long covered bridge there was the Green Island Bridge. And the Green Island Bridge was actually the cause of a tremendous fire in Troy that destroyed most of downtown. Um, this is a um, pen and ink drawing by a really talented American uh, illustrator of the 19th century, Harry Fenn. Um, he and a number of other artists uh, drew 
thousands of illustrations for the two volume set of uh, picturesque America. But this unusual structure has always captured my imagination. This is a steam shack um, and it would be used for heating um, and um, moisturizing wood to a point where it could be, where planks could be bent um, and used uh, to repair the hulls of various vessels. And here there are a couple of barges that are being worked on in the background, but it's such a uh, an odd structure, it, and so um, um, it's so unusual, and the clunkiness of it is something that fascinated me so much that um, a couple of years ago I made this painting of it, um, crooked chimneys and all. You can see a, a towboat. Maybe this is one of the Schuyler towboats, and a string of barges and um, uh, three-masted schooner coming down river with it. This is not far from Newburgh uh, near Storm King Mountain. This is a great book. If, if you ever have a chance and you're curious about the ice business, um, this, this book was an easy read and it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun and it's very informative. It's the, basically the story of Frederick Tudor um, who began the ice business in 1805 in Boston. And he had this idea, uh, this is before you could refrigerate any other way, of uh, cutting blocks of ice out of rivers and ponds and lakes, storing it somehow, and then um, in the summer months, shipping it south uh, to be used for making things like ice cream. Um, it was a business where it had, obviously it was trial and error, so it didn't, he wasn't always successful. He had times when it worked and times when it didn't, but the saga is an interesting one to follow. So I made this painting uh, for Peter and Martha Brown of the, um, uh, of a Hudson River ice house located between Hudson and Cook, the city of Hudson and uh, Cooksaki on the Hudson River. Actually, it's right across from Stockport Creek. It was, it's gone now. Um, the lighthouse that you see here in the background was called Four Mile Point Lighthouse. That's also gone. But this ice house had a tremendous steam plant here. And the steam engines that were part of this facility operated these lifts. In the wintertime, the blocks of ice would be cut in the river um, and they'd be placed on shelves on the lifts and then carried up into the ice house and then using elevators um, and conveyors, they would stack the ice inside the ice house. Uh, and then in the summertime, they'd reverse the process to load barges full of ice and then ship them south down the river. The, um, uh, the sloop, the two sloops that are here, the two schooners that are here in the sloop um, are carrying uh, sawdust from the Albany Lumber District. The sawdust at that time was the best insulator for the ice, and this is what kept the ice from uh, melting. And it was also used as the insulation for the ice when it was loaded aboard the barges uh, to keep the ice in pretty much um, uh, decent enough shape to be able to sell when they finally got to a port. Uh, this is a map um, of Pulaski from the um, Library of Congress archive. It's a great map. Um, Pulaski is an example of the height of water power and uh, industry in uh, New York State. It was one of the most successful mill towns. Um, it's not very far from Lake Ontario. And the water that you see kind of uh, making its way through the community is the Salmon River, which has a tremendous flow. So um, just to give you an idea of how many mills and how the water, how much the water was used for industry, if you kind of zero in into one section of the town, I've circled all the mills, and there were more than these. They had sluice ways that they had cut through parts of, um, 
the, the uh, mainland uh, to carry water to uh, a number of mills that were not on the river itself. And from this uh, uh, information, um, I had been commissioned to do a painting of Pulaski uh, in its uh, golden, golden age. So you can see some of those mills here in the background, and here's the Salmon River. Today, the mills are gone. Uh, the community is still making its way along, uh, surviving, uh, mostly because the Salmon River is a great place um, to fish. And uh, you might not be able to see it, but here in the sort of mid-ground of the painting, I have some fishermen in the river. This is the Rondout Creek uh, and the Hudson River in the background. Um, and this was part of the research that I did for uh, a painting a couple of years ago uh, that was commissioned by uh, Bruce and Jenny McKinney. Um, who live in San Francisco. Bruce and I have been friends um, since we were five years old and we've stayed in contact all those years. And Bruce really has a, a fondness for um, the Rondau um, and uh, the, uh, the heyday of uh, the waterway. The Rondout is what connected the Hudson River to the DNH Canal. And um, if you look here in the background of this photograph, those are all barges uh, that are, were in winter storage. This is just shortly before the canal, the DNH Canal, opened. Now, the DNH Canal went from about the middle of New York State into Pennsylvania and was used mostly for the transport of coal. Uh, this is the administrative building of, uh, for the um, barge company. Um, and then um, here is this unusual structure. This was a coal silo, which you'll see in a couple of more images, including the final painting. This is further in on the Rondout. Um, this is a part of Island Dock where the coal would be stored uh, before it was loaded onto barges and uh, transported downriver. Um, I love this photograph. This is the construction of the first railroad bridge that covered this, that crossed this uh, uh, deep ravine at the Rondout Creek. Um, this railroad bridge was built in, or I think it was finished around 1880. And what you see here is um, massive timber scaffolding that was put up um, uh, during the construction of the trestles that held the, the bridge work up. So uh, another uh, great bird's eye view from the collection of the Library of Congress. This is of Kingston. This is such an amazingly detailed uh, document. When you zo zoom in on it, you can see um, just how much detail there is. The churches are there, the buildings are there. They're carefully rendered in. Uh, for instance, there's that coal silo that we saw in the photograph right there, and it looks very much like it. And all the buildings, uh, especially the ones along the waterfront, have been detailed in that way. So this was a valuable uh, reference uh, for the painting. Uh, these are some of the digital models that I built. Um, I also uh, used... Um, a series of Sanborn maps, which I stitched together. These are tax maps that were made in the late 1800s, and they show every building for tax purposes. Not only every building, but um, all the support structures, barns, uh, sheds, things like that. And there's a key to the Sanborn maps that tells you whether they were brick, stone, or wood. So um, a document that was very helpful um, this is the Sanborn map used um, in a digital model where I'm starting to uh, put in all the buildings that I can see on the map that are going to appear in the painting. The painting started with a sketch on a pretty large canvas, almost 50 inches across. Um, and often when I paint, um, I'll do an underpainting. Um, and the underpainting is really designed to kind of set a, 
um, a tone or a character for the piece, you don't often really see it, but um, in the finished painting, um, you get a sense of uh, what it's doing. And so in this case, I just went, um, I went very heavy on color, very high color key, and I created this probably will look to most people like an abstract painting um, of the various, the intensity of tone that I wanted, um, the feeling that I wanted to have come through in the painting. Now, in paintings that are big and complicated like this with hundreds of buildings, I find it impossible to think of it all at once and kind of get it all down um, uh, as a sketch and then start to refine it. Um, I guess maybe partly because I'm so nervous about it. Um, so I started painting like this by actually working in sections. So here I've started a section of the painting and I just kind of continued that until I had the whole painting in at the first stage and then I went back and did some glazing and some refinements and added some details. But it went from this over the course of the next many months um, to this. And this is one of the more complicated paintings that I've done. And as I said, it was uh, commissioned by my friends in California, uh, Bruce and Jenny McKinney. Um, and they are the uh, premier sponsor of the exhibition at the Albany Institute, um, a sen the Sense of Time exhibit. So here you see, again, that coal silo, um, the Albany, the the uh, Dayliner Albany is docked back here. You can see a string of barges coming up. This is Island Dock. There's the bridge in the background. And these are a few of those hundreds of barges that you saw in the photograph. And a vessel they call the Queen of the Hudson, the Mary Powell, which is associated all the time with the Rondout Creek. Um, this is Kate Walker, um, German born, a widow um, with a 10 year old son who comes to America, uh, falls in love with a, um, a lighthouse keeper named John Walker. They marry in 1884 um, and um, she moves into uh, the lighthouse, which he is in charge of the Sandy Hook Lighthouse in New Jersey. And it's a charming place. And Kate loved this place. Um, uh, over the course of the next year, um, she became pregnant with her second child. And um, John was offered a job in another lighthouse that paid quite a bit more than Sandy Hook. Kate did not want to leave this place. She had a garden. There was a road nearby so she could get into a town for supplies, uh, but um, uh, to keep peace in the house, um, they moved to uh, John's new posting, which was not what she had in mind at all. It was this lighthouse. This is Manhattan. This is actual scale. This is the Robbins Reef Lighthouse. It's basically a steel tower on a pile of rocks in the middle of uh, the outer harbor of Manhattan. Uh, it's about uh, two thirds of the way from Manhattan to Staten Island. So it's, it, it sits on top of a, a very dangerous reef. That's why it's there. They move in. This is not Kate's idea of uh, a life she signed on for. They live in the lighthouse. Um, she has her second child, a daughter. And um, within a few months of the birth of her child, her husband died. Now the lighthouse service couldn't find a replacement to take over this lighthouse 
and they asked Kate if she would mind operating the lighthouse until they could find someone. And she agreed. Well, uh, from a few months, it turned to a few years, which turned into a few decades. And Kate Walker operated that lighthouse for 33 years. She um, rowed, uh, used, used the lifeboats that were at the lighthouse to take her kids to school every day. This is the painting that I made of Kate's light. And you can see in the background, there's the Statue of Liberty. Um, the figure at the lighthouse is Kate. Uh, this is a lighthouse tender, um, uh, the gardenia. All the lighthouse tenders were named after flowers. And um, you can see the lifeboats here. So she would load the kids in the boat, launch the boats, row them two miles to shore, uh, row back to the lighthouse, work all day, row back, pick up the kids at night, and then back to the lighthouse. Now, this went on throughout the school season. So this would have included winter months. And you can imagine the energy that it would consume just to make that, that trip. Um, Kate was also responsible for the rescue of a number of stranded sailors who had um, encounters with uh, the treacherous reef. Um, and she was eventually, she retired eventually and lived out the rest of her life in Manhattan but never went back to the lighthouse. Now there's another story about another woman and a lighthouse, and this time it's Lake Superior, uh, part of uh, the chain of islands called the Apostle Islands. The, the lighthouse was located on Raspberry Island. Her name was Cecilia McLean, and her husband Alexander was the keeper of the lighthouse um, on the island. And, um, uh, Cecilia was uh, interviewed uh, by uh, a local newspaper, and the one comment that seemed to stick in most people's minds uh, was when she said, I hate lighthouses. She could not stand this place. She couldn't stand the isolation of it. Um, this is a very small island in that chain, so the only thing that was there was the lighthouse. This is another uh, lighthouse uh, tender. This one is called uh, the Marigold, and the title of this painting is The Marigold at Raspberry Island. And if you look here, you can see the Model T pickup and uh, a figure back there. Um, that's Cecilia <clears throat> waiting uh, as patiently as the supplies are offloaded from the Marigold. And because she seems so bored, um, I gave her a piano. I thought that would help uh, with the boredom. I don't know whether it did or not. I don't even know if she had a piano. So um, this is Sixth Avenue in Troy. Uh, this is the way it looks pretty much now, uh, except for the snow. Um, but this is the way it looked about 150 years ago. Sixth Avenue, which is now vehicular traffic, at that time was the mainline tracks for the railroads, uh, predominantly used by the DNH Railroad. These two uh, trains are both DNH trains. Uh, this one is a passenger train bound from Albany to Troy and then back across the Hudson and up to Saratoga. The um, Railway shed is is long gone, um, as the tracks are. But at one time, that was a steamy, smoky area in Troy with a tremendous amount of traffic. Um, I was commissioned uh, to do a painting of the Schoharie Valley Railroad. Um, the man who commissioned it um, had spent a portion of his boyhood in the town of Schoharie, and he had always noticed this uh, museum, this little railway museum, and they had a passenger uh, car as part of their collection. The, the tracks, the railroad tracks, were long gone, and he was curious about what it looked like when it was actually in operation, and so um, 
that was a subject that we agreed on. And so I made a painting of, um, of the Schoharie Valley Railroad and the Schoharie Valley Railroad Depot. Uh, one of the challenges in this painting was, um, par in part, the engine itself, because I didn't really have a good reference for it. I had some photographs of it, but I didn't have any plans or anything like that. And I wanted to depict it at a very specific angle. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wanted to, to depict the entire train at a very specific angle, and that was for a reason. What you see in this painting is everything that the Schoharie Valley Railroad owned. They owned that building, that passenger car, this coal tender, and that engine. That was it. They didn't own any other cars. There were no freight cars. There were no other passenger cars, no caboose. So in order to give the painting a sense that they owned more than what you could see, I hid part of the, this their train here behind the depot to give you an illusion that there's a lot more of it you know, behind it. I loved making this painting. Um, it, to me, it just, it has such a great feeling of summer, that, that idea of a warm day and being in the shade and sort of taking this interesting scene in with a crystal clear sky. Um, it was, this was a, an enjoyable project. The carriage is, uh, this carriage was uh, sent to the, the uh, station uh, when, a, when a passenger, uh, when the passenger car arrived with visitors who would spend a summer in the town. The Parrot House was uh, the hotel in the town. Um, the, um, the main source of revenue for the Schoharie Valley Railroad was the Borden uh, Creamery which was not far from the station here. Borden's uh, was a dairy company um, and they, um, they had their own car. They had their own uh, freight car. And if you've ever heard the expression milk run, that's what this, this that was the main business of the Skahari Valley Railroad. They would hook up the train to the milk car and they would haul it eight miles up line to the, uh, d &H terminal and then the d &H railroad would take over to take the, their product uh, down to market. This is a typical of um, English locomotives of the uh, 19th and 20th century. This is the Flying Scotsman, uh, a beautiful uh, uh, beautiful uh, locomotive. Um, it's part of the collection at the York Railway Museum. Um, beautifully maintained, but you can see just the color of it and the shape of it. This is not typical in America. Um, American locomotives were not built this way. They weren't maintained like this. This is the locomotive that wound up at the Schoharie Valley uh, Railroad. Um, it was built in the 1870s for the Lackawanna and Bloomsburg Railroad, and it was a wood burner. That's what this stack was used for. This is called, this is, is a, a, a spark arrestor because uh, locomotives like this, this could easily start a fire because of the spew of sparks coming out of the firebox. So they had a device here with a turbine in it that would uh, disperse the sparks enough so that they were less of a fire hazard. But here it is in its pristine condition. It had a wooden cab with some nice details, um, nicely proportioned. Um, and years later, it, it be, it was purchased by the Schoharie Valley Railroad, and you can see the stack has been changed, the cab is different, the boiler has been ex expanded, um, and it's made up of a lot of parts from other locomotives. If you look at the, the forward truck here, the wheels don't match. Well, I was inspired enough by this workhorse locomotive to do a painting of it. Um, in the early 1900s in the 
its last few months of operation on the railroad. And you, you might be able to see, if you look carefully at the painting, that the wheels don't match. I wanted to make sure that I, I included that detail. Uh, this is a painting I made for uh, Keybank. Um, this is Syracuse, New York. It's set in the 1930s. Now, this is an engine that did have some uh, fame. Uh, this is a, a Hudson, belonged to the New York Central Railroad. And the train that you see here was a named train. It was the Empire State Express. And it operated between uh, Chicago and New York City. Believe it or not, the main line tracks of the New York Central Railroad went right through the middle of Syracuse, right down Washington Street. Um, and it wasn't one or two trains a day. At its peak, it was 60 trains a day, day and night. Um, there was a saying in Syracuse at the time that there was never a time that there wasn't a train coming on Washington Street. And the proximity of that train to those cars is not an exaggeration. A friend of mine, uh, Vincent Lapira, uh, restores old trucks, and he's been doing this now for quite some time. And he's a close friend. I've known him for a long time. And, um, and I was fascinated by this process. I would come to visit him every so often, and uh, there'd be some new bit that he had finished and installed. And I asked him if he'd be interested in a painting of his, his truck. This is a federal 1926 federal dump truck, big, heavy truck. And um, so he agreed. And over the course of a couple of months, um, I made this painting of that federal dump truck at a construction site in Troy. The bridge that you see in the background is the um, Green Island Bridge. Um, it was a lift bridge. It was originally built as a railroad bridge, but in 1926, it was altered so that it could accommodate vehicular traffic. Uh, this is the only painting that I've uh, made of a, of a construction site, and I enjoyed doing it. And it, the wonderful thing about working on this was every time I had a question about the, the focal point, um, the truck, um, I could go over to my friend's garage and with a tape measure and get the information that I needed. Um, I made several paintings that were set in the era of the Great Depression. Um, people needed work and um, um, they were desperate. So they would take a job, any job, no matter how difficult the job was, um, or how, how uh, demanding, how uh, exhausting it was, and how poor the pay was just to have a job. So they would work for uh, pennies an hour. And, um, um, and so one of the businesses at that time that was sort of booming in the, in, uh, the Hudson Valley was the strawberry business. So I did a painting of strawberry pickers during the depression. And I wanted to get a sense in this painting of the, of the variety of workers that would be uh, uh, attending this field. And um, so um, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed group. Um, and uh, I particularly enjoyed putting that kid in there, that little girl in there. And um, so these characters, sometimes in paintings, I kind of imagine them with what their life might be like after an experience like this. And I often wonder, uh, as that little girl grew to be a grandmother, what stories she may have told her grandchildren about the Depression and working in that field of strawberries in Catskill. Schenectady, the city of Schenectady was really founded and famous for the location of actually the headquarters of uh, General Electric. And uh, during the, the Depression, General Electric was still in operation there. 
uh, the city was looking for something uh, that could provide work for people and become a symbol of the resilience of the city. And so they decided in the midst of all this financial uh, disaster that they would build um, a, a new city hall. And so I was commissioned to do a painting of city hall in Schenectady uh, set in that time frame in the 1930s. So this is the painting that I made. The building is still there today, but I did it at night and made it a glow in light because of the presence of uh, General Electric in the town. The title of the painting is The Spirit of Schenectady and the painting hangs in the main conference room at, city, at city, the uh, City Hall building. Uh, this is um, Lake George, New York. Um, I made this painting um, some years ago. Uh, it was the way, at that time, that was the way the, um, uh, the waterfront looked. Uh, those are the uh, cruise boats that operate in the summer months. This is, however, is the middle of January. The lake is frozen and covered in snow and there's a squall coming up uh, in the background. Um, so this is a typical winter scene on, uh, in the town of Lake George. I've always been interested in flight and airplanes, and um, and they changed. They really changed life in the um, in the twentieth century. Uh, this is a fairly primitive uh, glider that was designed by Otto Lilienthal, a German inventor, um, and he created a number of these uh, kites and. Um, his work and his research inspired the Wright brothers, uh, who went on to fame as the uh, for creating a heavier than aircraft successful flying machine. Um, my interest in airplanes really began when I was very young. Um, my mother's youngest brother, Michael, who's pictured here, was a crop duster. And he owned uh, a uh, Piper Cub. And my mother, was, this was a short distance from where I lived. So my mother would uh, often uh, drive me over to his, his little airfield. And uh, we'd go in the hangar and he'd open up the Cub. And I was, you know, eight, nine years old. And he'd lift me up and he'd put me in the cockpit. I was a single seater. And I remember the smell in there, the leather, the leather of the upholstery of the pilot seat. Um, he would show me how to manipulate the stick uh, to uh, control the ailerons. Um, I was too short to reach the pedals, so he, but he explained how the rudder was operated. Um, and uh, he was a he was uh, a hero of mine. He used to fly after a day of working on his farm, he would fly over our house and um, I'd be out in the yard playing when he flew over. And I remember he would wave his wings of his airplane as it passed over our house. Um, when I was nine years old, he had a, an accident with this aircraft and, and was killed. And um, it was a traumatic event for my entire family and for me, uh, but I, it never destroyed my interest in aircraft. And that's why there are so many paintings of airplanes um, in my portfolio. Um, this is a wonderful place to visit. This is um, near Kingston, uh, kind of across the river from Kingston and north of Poughkeepsie in Rhinebeck, New York. Uh, the Rhinebeck Aerodrome, and it's a collection of World War I aircraft, replicas and restored aircraft that are, are flown in air shows uh, once a week in the summertime. And on one of those visits to the museum, I photographed uh, an English aircraft, a uh, Sopwith Dolphin, and then uh, painted it um, over the Midlands in uh, England. This is circa 1917. 
Um, these are uh, biplanes from uh, the, uh, the years just before World War II. That's a uh, Hawker Fury over here. And both of these are uh, Army, U.S. Army uh, Curtis Hawks. Um, I love the, uh, the paint scheme for this particular airplane. Uh, in this painting, um, uh, the, uh, the Hawk is flying over uh, Lake Champlain. This is Valcour Island in the background. During the Second World War, New York played a major role in the aircraft uh, industry, uh, building planes for the Army Air Corps and the Navy. Um, Grumman was located at Bethpage, Long Island, and they built airplanes for the, uh, the Navy. Um, and the names are all very famous, Avenger, Wildcat, Hellcat. Uh, one of the aircraft that was built there was a amphibious aircraft, and I just love the design of it. I, I've always just been uh, impressed by the its seaworthiness. It had a huge hull under the fuselage, and then these balancing pontoons out on the wingtips. This particular plane uh, was assigned to the USS Yorktown, uh, which was involved in a famous battle in the Pacific during the war. Uh, the Republic Company, um, Farmingdale, Long Island, they built a number of different airplanes. Probably the most famous one was the P-47 Thunderbolt. And I did a, a painting of Thunderbolts in England uh, during the war. This is an RAF base um, after a, a rainstorm. Um, and these airplanes are getting ready for their, their next mission. Kind of following along with uh, the World War II um, era, this is Albany today. Um, and anchored along the seawall permanently in Albany is this uh, museum ship. It's a, a, a destroyer escort that was a part of naval operations during World War II. And it's been beautifully restored. Um, Visitors can go aboard and get a sense of what life was like on a destroyer escort in, during World War II. So I was commissioned to do a painting of, um, of this vessel. This is the USS Slater. And I made a couple of sketches first. This is a sketch of uh, the Slater in a rough North Atlantic Sea. And this is the, um, the larger work, the finished work. This is the title of this work is Contact, and it depicts the Slater during uh, an assignment on convoy duty, uh, responding to a sonar uh, blip uh, indicating the presence of a submarine. Um, Stratton Air Force Base is located in Schenectady, New York, just outside of Schenectady, New York. And um, they have uh, uh, these Hercules uh, C-130s there. Um, they're part of the New York State Air National Guard. It's the 109th Airlift Wing. And what they do is they supply um, stations in uh, the Arctic, um, on, in Greenland, and also in Antarctica. Those flights are still ongoing. I was commissioned to do a painting for a retiring general there, um, Lawrence Massarella, who was a general in charge of this base. And so I did a painting of one of his missions over Greenland. This is Sandestrom in Greenland. These LC-130s had skis, and um, um, as well as, uh, I guess the skis could be removed. Um, or they were designed in such a way that they could use regular landing gear when they were back in at the Schenectady base. But for landing in Greenland, they would use the skis. And uh, Larry told me a number of stories about his flights. Um, and he told me about one that he was, uh, where, where he was sent to Greenland and they were delayed a bit in offloading their cargo and a terrible snowstorm uh, began. 
and the snow was really coming down and piling up. And they were afraid that they were going to get snowed in, that they wouldn't be able to uh, taxi in this soft, powdery snow and get this heavy aircraft off the ground. So he told me they decided that they were going to make an attempt anyway. They powered up uh, their, uh, their engines and they began taxiing. And he told me they taxied for 14 miles before they could get up enough speed to get airborne uh, and make it back to their, their base in uh, New York State. So um, that's the end of the slide portion of this program, but I wanted to kind of summarize, uh, this is the fourth part, and I wanted to go over just a bit of parts uh, one, two, and three to kind of explain why they were organized the way they were organized. Part one, background influences and techniques. I focused part one on my family history. Uh, my grandparents, this is, these are my grandparents on my dad's side, my grandparents on my mother's side. This is where I grew up. This is my father's store. That's my father behind the counter. My bedroom was behind the sign. You might remember that from, from uh, that uh, video that we did. Um, and I emulated my movie heroes, Davy Crockett. And I grew up in a place that was beautiful. Uh, the landscape was beautiful. The hills, the mountains, and the stone houses of New Paltz, all uh, part of this experience of, of growing up in the Hudson Valley. And the reason why I show this, and I want you to see this, is that as an artist, depicting, trying to objectively depict history, I can't help but have part of me, part of my life experiences, creeping into the paintings. I try to control it as much as I can because I want you to believe that what you're looking at actually took place. So, but you still need to know this about me. Part two uh, was mostly about um, history and about the beginnings of um, New York State. And that focused on the people who lived here before the arrival of Europeans. Um, Henry Hudson and the arrival of the Dutch, um, the, uh, uh, the settlement that kind of reached beyond uh, the towns and the forts, and the development that took place in uh, Manhattan. And um, I wanted you to get a sense of how this place evolved uh, and the techniques that I used uh, to create these paintings. So a, lot, a substantial amount of time was spent in, um, in this video to kind of get that message across. When we got to part three, I wanted to give the audience a sense of the research. So I talked about the maps and the documents that I used. Um, these are archeological uh, diagrams. Um, made by Joe Diamond uh, for the painting that I made of New Paltz, my hometown, in uh, the 1680s. This is not, I didn't, in, I invented this scene and I interpreted the elements in this scene, but this footprint of these structures was actually found. So it's based on, on fact. This is Albany. Uh, this is a painting that is in the collection of the Albany Institute. That's the same thing, trying to really, to create an environment that was believable and an event that we know actually took place. So that was the last of the images and or one of the, there's one more. But I, want, I want you to know that um, my goal has always been to foster interest in grassroots history, to make the people who live on this land, in this environment, aware of what took place all around them, and to portray it as carefully as I could to get the story as right as it could be. 
one of the ideas I had in mind was that maybe if people knew more about it, they would take better care of it before they lost it. And so the last slide for today is uh, this line from the introduction that I wrote uh, for the book, A Sense of Time. History is what we all share like water and air. And I believe totally in my heart um, that history is something that can be used to bring us together. In a time when we are so fractured, so divided and so polarized, this is a powerful element that belongs to all of us. And so with that, um, that's the end of uh, this program. Well, thank you, Lynn. And I, I will just sort of with a comment um, based on those last two slides about history, I will say, based on a lot of the comments that come through from visitors from the exhibit about your attention to detail, uh, the research you put into all of your paintings that I think you do inspire that connection to history. Well, that's good, because uh, <laughs> otherwise I would have wasted 40 years. <laughs> Uh, so at this point, if anybody does have any questions or any comments uh, that you'd like to ask um, Len, please feel to either, if you're more comfortable typing something into the chat box, uh, I can read it off to him. If you feel comfortable and you want to unmute yourself and ask, that's perfectly okay too. Um, there were a couple of just comments that came through during the presentation, so I'll read those really quickly. and. First two were sort of more historical in nature. Uh, Pamela, in reference to um, the, the painting where you referenced the Troy fire, fire, she put the date on there. The fire happened May 10th of 1862. And then in reference to the Green Island Bridge, um, she said that that itineration of the Green Island Bridge succumbed to high water March 15th, 1977. The new one seems to be holding up okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Caroline, in reference to your story about your uncle, said, um, this is a lovely tribute. Sorry for your fa family's terrible loss, and thank you for sharing the important memories. Um, Rosaria said, a, wonder a wonderful presentation, as always. Uh, another comment, um, thank you so much. Uh, having, having enjoyed everything you presented over the past few months, um, Jeff and, and Ricky asked, where is Schuyler? I'm going to assume that that's in reference to uh, maybe Samuel, Samuel Schuyler um, and maybe in reference to where he might be buried, if we know. Uh, we don't know where um, Samuel Sr. is buried, although his uh, family um, uh, included his name on the monument at the Albany Rural Cemetery for a really great description of the Black Schuylers, um, uh, do a Google search of Captain Samuel Schuyler Albany, and I think it will bring you to Stefan Belinsky's um, New York State Museum website, where he describes in great detail the property they owned. Oh, there's another, um, there's another, there's another place where there's some great information. It's the Hudson River Maritime Museum also has uh, a good description of the Schuylers and uh, their operations on the, the Hudson River. But one of the reasons why um, I include that in presentations, I mean, it's, it's an incredible story to think that a Black family in Albany uh, during the Civil War could have a successful uh, business of that scale um, at that time, but I have had a number of people insist uh, that they couldn't be black, mm -hmm. and that bothers me a lot. And uh, you can, as you can imagine, all the people who object are white. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that that family was there and that family accomplished something amazing. Uh, so Jeff and Ricky did just send a quick, they meant, uh, they meant, they meant to say, where is Skylar house, not just where oh, is Skylar. It's so, in South Albany. I'm not sure exactly what street it's on, but it, it is called out in one of those, um, on one of those websites. There's a color photograph of the house and it gives the location. It's privately owned. 
And some years ago, it's quite a while now, I think maybe 20 years ago, the people that owned that house were uh, friends of ours and we were invited there for a party. It was, a, I think it was a New Year's Eve party and they held it in the turret on the roof. And uh, you could see how magnificent that must have been in the heyday of the harbor in Albany because it's, it's a 360 degree view of the city and 180 degree view of the river. Um, some more comments. So Kim said that you make us all feel like we are there. So I think that's part of what you are going for. Uh, Maura said, really enjoy, enjoyable program. It's fascinating to see how you develop and assemble your scenes. Um, and Pamela also said that she very much admires and appreciates your attention to detail and accuracy, which is why the baker's wife um, seen in a previous program puzzles me. Why is she riding side saddle on the wrong side of the horse? Uh, why is she riding a farm horse? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you should tell her to maybe she should make a print and turn it around the other way. Like, yeah, they <laughs> there. doesn't really exist anyway. <laughs> um, Caroline said and asked, uh, she's marveling at your encyclopedic knowledge. Two questions. Are there particular New York history slash landscape painters whose work you admire or emulate? And two, Given your interest in preservation, are there particular areas of the Hudson Valley that you you feel are at risk of being lost to history? Yeah, I can think of one right off the bat, Albany. <laughs> uh, but it's true everywhere. You know, I'm, we talked about Pulaski. It's um, it's really a, a it's a sad uh, shadow of its former self. And now you can't, we can't recreate the industry that was here in the 19th century, uh, but we haven't done a very good job of figuring out alternate uses uh, for some of these places. And maybe that's just the dilemma of our time. In terms of artists that I have found inspiring, um, um, the names that come to mind, um, Fitzhugh Lane was a great American painter. Um, uh, lived in Gloucester. Um, E.W. Cook is a favorite of mine. He's a British uh, painter, uh, marine painter. Um, love his work. Very, in, it's really inspiring. Um, of the living contemporary artists, probably the top of my list would be John Stobart, who's now approaching 90. Um, a man of incredible skill and ability and a great interest in history. And then probably maybe the absolute top of the list uh, would be Rembrandt. And, um, and the reason why I like Rembrandt so much is because um, he, he, he depicted the world that he saw. He depicted it the way it was. I mean, he's, he's famous for painting people's portraits and, uh, and painting them the way they were. In, at the beginning of his career, this was a um, novelty. And people were drawn to him because of the fact that he could create such a great likeness. Uh, but then, you know, after a while, um, he started to get clients who said, you know, can you take a few pounds off? And um, I want to be on a horse and I don't want the wart on my face over here. And so he fell out of uh, his popularity waned. But he also, another aspect of his long career was that he did beautiful drawings and engravings of uh, Dutch life in the mid 1600s. He is depicting the farmers and the workers and the small communities and the cities in the Netherlands at the exact same time that the Dutch are here in New York. So when I look at Rembrandt, it's, they aren't photographs, but it's a person who is recording the people and places of his time that influenced New York State so much. So he is, other than being a, a masterful uh, artist, 
he was a great documenter of his era. So those are the artists that come to mind right away, but there are many, many, many others. Uh, Christine did type in the address of the Skyler House. So uh, 2 Ashgrove Place off Grand Street is the location of the Skyler House. Mm -hmm. um, and then Gail said, gorgeous paintings. Thank you so very much. So. Um, I want to give it another few seconds if anybody else has any questions or comments that they would like to ask before we wrap up today. Um, I want to. Yeah. Can I, yes. can I say anything? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. This Go is uh, this is uh, Chris. I've known Len, uh, Len and Cor. We've known you for uh, coming up to forty years in um, July. We're in Whitbourne, which you know very well. Um, one of the things I think Len is able to do is. Um, with all the technical ability and all the historical background that he gives us to the paintings, he's also able to draw us so close that we fall into the painting itself. And there's a lot of background that he gives to it. Um, and suddenly you're in this painting and the world expands around you with his stories about everything, all the details, whether it's about a house, about the people that live there, about the transportation that was around the place. And I, I, you know, it's just been amazing to see that development. And we've got the good thing, the good news is that we've got lots more to look forward to. Thank you, Len. Thanks, Chris. Yes, thank you. And I'm sure there's many, many people here who agree uh, with that statement. So, uh, so one more comment again, thank you uh, from Jeff and Ricky and they appreciate your uh, prodigious research. So I think that that's a, a comment that many people would echo here. Len, I do want to thank you. Yes, I, we see a couple uh, virtual round of applause. Um, there, uh, we are working on uh, hopefully one more program with Len uh, in June. Um, I don't have too much details so at this point, but I do want everybody to keep an eye on the Albany Institute website, social media pages, um, and hopefully we will have a, uh, a program in June um, coming up uh, and we'll have a date and everything. And Tamis, our executive director, just uh, typed in the chat box, the next talk will be a conversation between Len and Russell Shorto. Uh, we are working on a date for that program, um, which is still to be determined. So please stay tuned uh, for more information and uh, keep an eye on our website and social media sites for an announcement. Um, and thank you everybody who joined us today. Len, thank you again for your uh, program. And I wish everybody a great rest of their day. So yes, one more round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, so thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Len, thank you for the presentation. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Bye-bye.